Welcome, welcome. We are here for the um, session on transitional English. My name is Angie Garza. I am the Director of Professional Learning and Educational Services for ROE 47. Uh, we serve Lee, Ogle, and Whiteside counties, and I have had the pleasure um, of working on transitional English um, with uh, the Competency Development Group uh, at the state level, also doing some state level work that you'll hear about today with regards to supporting the work statewide. And then, of course, with our regional partnership, I'm sitting here today in um, one of our partner school districts uh, for transitional English. So um, really excited that that was a, a part of my day today and, and to be able to come and share all of this with all of you. So Melvin, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to give us some words of inspiration. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Melvin Harrison, Director for Academic Affairs at the Illinois Community College Board. And um, I'm enjoying the last few moments of virtual work as I'm broadcasting live from New Orleans today. But um, I'm happy to be here and uh, have been a part of this transitional instruction journey uh, since I joined the Community College Board almost three years ago uh, and have worked alongside Angie and Heather and some of our other colleagues at state agencies and uh, particularly with uh, colleagues within the system to um, expand and to implement uh, transitional structure. So I'm really excited to be here today uh, with you all and I'm excited to share some of the great work that's happening across the state and the work that we're doing uh, in building these bridges. So uh, as we get kicked off for our hour together, which is going to be jam-packed full of information, um, we wanted to make sure that you had uh, just some introductory information. Uh, Heather has very kindly put the link to the slides in the chat. We will be asking you to join us on some of those slides uh, to give us some feedback. So uh, go ahead, your chat button, if you aren't familiar with Zoom, which I'm sure you are by now, is that uh, kind of dialogue looking button at the bottom center of your screen. Um, we have also included in these slides links to the uh, Transitional English Language Arts resources, as well as the competencies and policies document. You will find that there are numerous hyperlinks throughout this uh, slide presentation um, that we would invite you to save and, and access later at your leisure. Um, we are also very interested in hearing your thoughts and questions. So in addition to those interactive slides, we'll be asking you to, um, you know, chime in either through chat or unmuting at various points during our hour together. Um, but just as a quick reminder, um, in the upper right hand corner of your picture or in the lower left hand corner of your Zoom control screen, you do have the, mute, uh, the ability to mute and unmute yourself with the microphone. Um, we um, have some video controls there, which I'm sure you're all aware of. It looks like the little movie camera down in the bottom uh, left hand corner of your screen. Um, and then of course, don't be afraid to use that chat button. We won't use breakout rooms today, although they are my favorite. So our first uh, conversation this morning, we wanna hear from you. Um, so this is an interactive slide. So if you join me, if you're on the interactive slides, join me on slide four. And what you're going to do is these are all editable. So you can double click. If you'll notice, I've put my cursor into a box. We want you to give us your thoughts on what is your role in transitional English implementation and what do you hope to learn today? So um, please feel free to use those interactive slides. We'll watch as those responses come in. And if you're having challenges, please don't be afraid to use that chat. I'll give you a moment to respond. See, we might have some. Lori, that's okay. If your Chromebook isn't helpful, feel free to use the chat. Absolutely. See some more responses coming in. We have some community college representation. Uh, 
Uh, we have someone with us who's supporting. Something new with us today. I love this. Yeah, I want to do one of these slides in the future. Love it. <laughs> I always leave with like, I want to make this better a part of my presentation so much better. So thank you, Angie. You always bring. <laughs> thank you, Melvin. Okay, we have someone with us from uh, teaching developmental English. Um, Lori is a principal and a former CTE teacher. Got a lot of great representation with us this morning. If you have um, some ideas on um, what specifically you would like to learn today, give us that too, and we will make sure we spend some time on that together. I love that each of you is, is thinking about how you can best support um, your, your faculty as well as your partnerships, which is a really important piece of this um, as we look to implement transitional English statewide. All right, well, I wanna say thank you so much for your feedback. We'll have another interactive slide um, later, but again, please feel free to use the, the chat as we go through and we're gonna kind of um, continue on with some of our, our conversations. So I'd like to start us off this morning with just um, some common language, common knowledge, common resources. So we're gonna talk for a minute about the competencies and policies. You'll notice that it's blue and underlined here because once again, we have tried to hyperlink some of these resources throughout the slides for you. So I mentioned earlier, and both Melvin and Heather were part of this extraordinary journey, um, and I would welcome them to chime in at any point in time. Um, but really, when we think about transitional coursework, both with math and English language arts, this was a collaborative effort between secondary and post-secondary, between um, the state agencies, so ICCB, IBHP, all of our lovely acronyms, ISBE, um, support out of our Ed System Center. Um, and we came together, we came together as a, a group of stakeholders to really talk about what it was that we wanted our students to know and be able to do in order to successfully transition into credit bearing coursework at the post-secondary level. So this work occurred and we finished up, I think right before the pandemic hit um, in December, 2019 through March of 2020 to really define what those competencies and key performance indicators look like. So in thinking about, and you have there an image of what the final product looks like if you haven't been able to take a look at that document. Um, but in addition to those competencies and key performance indicators, we also started talking about what is the philosophy? What is the focus of transitional English? And really what we settled on as a, a collaborative group was the fact that we wanted students to engage in college level texts and text is a very um, broad term. Uh, we're gonna talk more about that in just a moment, but the primary focus of that should be nonfiction. Uh, we want to prepare students for making that transition successfully into a credit bearing course at the post-secondary level. So that nonfiction focus uh, was very important. We also wanted to select materials that were interesting to students that offered choice. And we really wanted to engage them further by tying it into their life and career goals. Um, so this, this may be an opportunity for those students who have historically struggled um, to engage in something very meaningful uh, in order to grow their capacity for success moving on with their education and their career goals. From a philosophical standpoint, we also wanted to make sure that there was this focus on metacognition. How are we getting students to think about their thinking? Um, how are they using different reading and writing strategies? Why would they use those? Um, how could they best use those to be successful? What works for them? Um, and so the competencies and key performance indicators were couched around this idea of engaging students in reading, writing, and then that intersection, which is critical thinking and analysis. 
you'll notice that metacognition and those essential skills for um, process competencies and, and workforce employability skills, those all encompass the work that we're doing as well. So with that in mind, um, those competencies and key performance indicators were developed. And so if you haven't had an opportunity to look at the competencies and KPIs, this is what they look like in the document. So um, here we have students can consider reading and writing tasks and adapt their approaches and strategies. So what are those look for's in reading? And what are those look for's in writing? Um, they're written in such a way where reading and writing are constantly complementing one another and intersecting at that juncture of critical thinking and analysis. One of the other tasks as we look at uh, kind of defining what transitional English is, is this idea of portability. Um, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the portability process um, that was put into place for transitional math. That portability conversation is very similar with English. Um, and so, you know, we want to make sure that the criteria for portability is met because portability means that a student is guaranteed placement at a community college in their district or across the state of Illinois, as well as any um, identified accepting Illinois university. So there are a set of um, requirements that need to be met in terms of submissions to that portability panel. Um, including a syllabus, the content competency spreadsheet, the MOU between the um, secondary institution and the post-secondary institution, as well as a course submission form. And all of this is submitted to the local portability panel, which then um, in turn sends a representative sample to the state portability panel, which meets two times per year, once in the fall, and then once in the spring. And I'm going to pick on Melvin um, because he is uh, kind of spearheading that portability process. So Melvin, anything you wanna to add to this idea of portability? Uh, sure, uh, just uh, for those of you who may be on the call working with the institutions, I want you to keep in mind that March 1st and October 1st are the submission deadlines. And uh, if you are not uh, linked in or in tune with the iPlacement database, uh, you're welcome to reach out to me and I'll get you uh, there because that's where you would actually uh, upload your submissions and that's where the portability panel reviews your documents and provides feedback. So uh, if you're not in tune with that process or uh, with that database, uh, send me an email. I'm happy to connect you and get you all. And you know, Melvin, I think that portability piece is so powerful because unlike in the past where we might have had agreements with our local community college for placement, this really is a guarantee statewide for students to be able to enter credit bearing coursework and not be placed in, in developmental coursework. Absolutely. Um, it is guaranteed statewide placement. So that is a, a a valuable aspect, uh, asset of making sure that your course uh, is aligned and approved for portability. So do make sure that you uh, get that because your students, you never know where they may go. And because we also have uh, four-year partners who are accepting uh, transitional instruction, it'll uh, support them whether they're going to a community college or to a four-year. Thank you. So those are some of those, those uh, pieces that were put into place very early on. Um, important part of building the system statewide for supporting students and helping to um, bolster their success. So we wanna spend just a little bit of time about focusing on maybe some regional storytelling. I'm gonna kind of share with you our journey from a, a regional partnership perspective. I'm also going to share with you a little bit of information um, about what we're doing for statewide support um, through uh, our very important partners who convene once a month to, to have those conversations and to create some work products. And then uh, Melvin's going to um, share additional information with us uh, to, as we kind of work our way toward the end of our hour together um, to, to really kind of paint that picture about where we're going. So um, I am super proud. I mentioned earlier that I'm sitting here um, in the Amboy School District. Amboy is one of our partners in transitional math and transitional English. 
um, here doing some work today um, as, as part of our partnership work. Um, and I can't, I can't tell you enough how important and how vital it is to have strong partnerships in your region. Um, it is the heartbeat of our work together. And we've actually taken the regional professional learning community approach where we um, meet frequently. And we're not just talking about developing those pieces, although you'll see in just a minute, that's what a lot of our work has been centered on. Um, but it's also coming back to is what we are doing helping our students to be successful? And if not, what can we do to do better? Um, so we've got some, some data pieces that we're also working on. So I'd just like to share with you for a few minutes some of the work that we've undertaken as a partnership to maybe paint that picture um, about the possibilities for the work and the power of transitional coursework. So we um, started actually partnership work many years ago. And I will tell you that at the time it was very perhaps unfocused. I, I, I don't know that we knew as a partnership what it was that we should be centering our conversations on. Um, and so when, when the idea of transitional coursework came about, it really gave a purpose and a sense of urgency. Um, so we, we started with transitional math. We've grown that work now to transitional English. Um, we had started three or four years ago with creating a, a toolkit for our high school educators on, on getting into conversations about critical thinking, rhetorical analysis. Um, and then when the competencies and policies were finalized for transitional English, we were full steam ahead um, and very blessed and fortunate to have uh, some of those key players at the table already. We knew that this was a shift for some of our high school educators, and we knew that we needed to bridge the gap between secondary and post-secondary. So we started actually with a regional literacy practices survey. So we asked our high school educators who were going to be involved in the work, what practices are, that are you using currently in your classroom? What does, what does current instruction curriculum and assessment look like? Um, in order to give us a really great baseline for moving forward. Um, and so we, we got some valuable data back that we shared not only with our group, but also with our administrators in our um, service area uh, to start having some of these conversations. The second piece that we really talked about was this idea of vision. So we said, what based on what we've read in the competencies and policies document and what we know about current practice, where are we headed? Uh, so we kind of took a look at some OER resources. We talked about what we valued as a secondary and post-secondary group as far as English instruction. And we really took that time to establish our vision and our belief system around the course, as well as around our partnership, which I think was an incredibly important component of this work because it was the foundation of all of our collaborative efforts. We also then uh, took some time to actually close read the competencies and the key performance indicators. Um, so you'll see here on your screen, a sample of some of that work, our teachers and our both secondary and post-secondary came together to really define the language with one another. And then we took time to talk about what would this look like if we were looking for evidence of learning and how does this crosswalk with those grade 12 standards um, that have already been articulated for English language arts um, by our Illinois State Board of Education. And that's an important piece that I would urge you to consider uh, because this is unlike transitional math, this can be dovetailed, transitional English can be dovetailed with a regular credit bearing uh, high school English course, because we do have a four-year uh, graduation requirement for English in the state of Illinois. It, in taking that uh, information that we had from our close reading, we also then decided to build competency rubrics. So we had a clear understanding of what that learning trajectory looked like. We were inspired by building 21 and building 21 has a lot of great competency rubrics on there. So we kind of used that format um, and talked about each competency and key performance indicator and what that might look like on a continuum so that we could better diagnose moving forward where our students were at with their learning and what success really looked like. It went a long way in building and reinforcing that common language. 
from there, and this seems like a lot, this is two years worth of work um, that I'm sharing with you right now. Um, but we spent some time talking about themes and tech sets. We, we determined in order to get that reading writing connection and to really enforce with students this idea of critical thinking and analysis, as well as building in some of those process competencies um, and metacognition components, we, we needed to build things and build resources around this idea of themes. We also know with text, if you are a fan of Natalie Wexler's work, we wanted to build content knowledge. We didn't want content to be a barrier to rich conversations about uh, what the students were reading and ultimately what they would be writing about. So we thought, what would engage students? What topics would better and best prepare them for making that transition from secondary to post-secondary? What are things that they are passionate about that they would really dig into and that we could pull a lot of rich texts around? So not only that nonfiction piece, but we also looked at things like propaganda. We looked at music. We looked at art um, and pulled in a variety of different types of texts to make that accessible and an enriching experience for our students. Just some other examples here for you. Finally, we, um, as we moved uh, to the conclusion of summer 2020 in one of our first years of working together, uh, we did start to build out some units of instruction and we modified some of the building 21 maps, um, curriculum maps, and uh, started to sketch out what we wanted that learning to look like and how it would all fit together to meet those competencies and key performance indicators. And I, I want to highlight this piece right here. One of the things you'll submit for portability is um, the content competencies spreadsheet. You are going to want to know as a partnership where all of those competencies and key performance indicators are being addressed. So we have started work on a scope and sequence document that kind of articulates where each of these are found in the units of instruction that we were developing. And um, I found that it was extraordinarily helpful in then going back and filling out that spreadsheet to have this resource um, at our disposal. It was intriguing and really beneficial for us to come together secondary to post-secondary to have conversations, um, not only about defining language, but um, really reaching consensus on what this looked like in the classroom. So one of the conversations we had was, if we're going to allow students to go through that drafting and redrafting um, experience with feedback, what does that look like? How are we defining this idea of multiple drafts that are alluded to in those competencies and key performance indicators? So we came up with a list um, that of shared expectations and language that uh, we would carry forward in our partnership work together. And then we were able to come back, even though we were still um, working through a pandemic, uh, we were able to come back in the summer of 22 or 21, excuse me, uh, we met virtually um, and were able to put several other pieces in place to support this implementation. One of the things that I'm probably most proud about in our partnership work is that we did think it was a priority to make the connection to careers. Uh, so we did contract with a local videographer um, who went out and interviewed several of our, our business folks from around the community and asked them, how do you use reading and writing in what you do? How do you use math? Um, so I've included a hyperlink there to our webpage um, with some of the work that we've done in um, kind of making that connection to not only college readiness, but to career readiness. Um, also very proud of all of the work of our teachers um, to really think about how we're incorporating soft skills, um, how all of those curricular resource pieces are coming together. And then we felt it was very important to have somebody exter externally review some of the work. So we did contract outside of our group to have someone independently review the work and give us feedback on what could be made better or clearer, um, just to make sure that we have a clarity as we roll this out across our region. And I will tell you that the work continues. So um, 
we <laughs> we are probably I'm looking at this list now of all of the all of the bullets and I I might be feeling a little overwhelmed, but this is great stuff. This is good work. Um, so we we have as part of our partnership um, plans that are outlined well into the fall of 2022 um, as we continue this professional learning community with one another. And really that going back to that idea of partnerships as being essential in this work, I can't I can't say that enough. It's ongoing work, it's collaborative work, it's trusting work. Um, so think about your partnerships and where you're at with that. I know we have some great partnerships across the state, um, and I'm confident that each of you has similar experiences. So that's a little bit about some, some regional work that we've accomplished, but I, I am also very proud to say that I'm able to work with partners from across the state in supporting work in implementation of transitional English from Chicago all the way down past Springfield. Um, and it's allowed me the incredible opportunity to um, not only meet with different districts and colleges and organizations, but meet and work with some fantastic people who are so talented and have so much to contribute because they are so passionate about English and making our children successful. So I wanna share with you just a little bit about our state level work um, that is occurring right now with transitional English um, because we want to be able to build this capacity statewide and not have um, our districts or community colleges incur a lot of additional costs to make this happen. So we do have a resource development team um, comprised of secondary and post-secondary members. Um, those folks have uh, volunteered their time to continue to meet virtually in order to identify resources that we might need statewide to evaluate and review resources for statewide release from various partnerships, as well as to create resources that would be made available statewide. Um, and so we do have some cross-representation with the portability panel members and so, um, as well as with those ori original competency writing member groups so that we have um, ensured alignment and cross communication. So the first thing we did was we identified what are some quick wins that people might need in order to start this work. Um, so this is all of the work that has been accomplished to date. Um, so uh, we, we do have some resources developed um, to provide some additional guidance on how to put together text sets and how to sequence those texts, some sample text sets. We have released an annotated template for putting together a unit of instruction, um, talking about what those good features of those units might be. Um, we've talked about using positive and provided examples of how we might use positive asset-based language to recruit students. Um, we've um, thought about and, and are continuing to uh, consider and develop and share resources, not only for our administrators and our counselors to appropriately recruit and place students, but then also um, to students and parents to enroll them in transitional English. Um, and then there are great partners across the state who already have some wonderful units of instruction that we have reviewed and have put out as exemplars um, on the website. So there are some ready-made resources that are already out there and available because they have been um, identified as quick wins. And if you look at our next slide, um, if you join me on slide 26, uh, you can see some of that work hyperlinked here for you. Um, so please feel free to take advantage of those. Um, and we are very interested, and please feel free to use the chat if you would like um, to give us some information and feedback about some other resources that you might like to see to support your work with transitional English. We also uh, have had some conversations and started some work that is a little bit more long-term in nature. So we decided as a group that we would really like to put out a, a model resource that takes a teacher through an entire year of transitional English, complete with text sets, developed units of instruction, sample assessments, 
and additional activities and guidance documents um, that would really kind of solidify that vision for what transitional English is all about. Again, going back to those shifts in the competencies and policies document that are really focused on this idea of critical thinking and analysis, metacognition, authentic learning, connections to college and career. So what does that look like? And so really that's, that's our goal, um, to put together some of these bigger pieces um, as inspirations or even for teachers to use in their classroom if resources and, and finances are prohibitive. So here's where we would, I think, like some of your feedback, because the other piece of our work together as a statewide team is thinking about professional learning, and that's really my passion. I love uh, supporting teachers with this work and the conversations to build partnerships. Um, so the state team that, that meets together um, really also does talk about those professional learning needs. And here are some of those pieces that we've already identified. So we've talked about statewide, there might be some needs to um, help partnerships wrap their brains around transitional English. Why are we doing it? How do we make this happen? Um, more information about portability. How do we change our instruction, our curriculum, our assessments to best meet those shifts and those competencies and policies? Um, what do we need to think about in terms of recruitment? That might be another professional learning need. Um, are there opportunities for us to come together uh, in our various partnerships across this, the state to calibrate some student writing? And what would that look like? Um, and how do we connect um, instructionally reading, writing, speaking, listening, and research um, to best prepare students for whatever their future holds after they graduate from high school. So those are some of our initial conversations. If you would join me on slide 30, I have another interactive slide for you. And I'm interested from your partnership perspective, what are some of those resources or professional learning pieces that you might need in your partnership to best meet the needs of your students? Um, so I'm going to give you a moment to go ahead and once again, as we did before, um, click on slide 30, pick up, you can double click on a box and type some of your thoughts. And if you are having some challenges with those interactive slides, we would invite you to put that information into the chat. we already have some feedback in our first box on our interactive slide related to um, opportunities for high school partners to collaborate with each other. I think that's phenomenal. We've got some great educators statewide. Another piece of feedback, meet with the JUCO partners on curriculum and assessment and continue to communicate throughout the school year. Ooh, TILA evaluation and assessment. I'm gonna pick on whoever just for just a minute and you probably didn't know that I would pick on you, but if you're able to, whoever wrote the evaluation and assessment piece, if you wouldn't mind unmuting and sharing with us a little bit more about that. Well, it was me. Um... <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> Just looking at the, uh, I wrote that in thinking about um, as we continue in our work to evaluate the effectiveness of transitional instruction uh, across the state and we're uh, collecting a lot of data and preparing to do an analysis on it, um, sharing that information out to the field and uh, making appropriate adjustments as necessary uh, to ensure the students are being successful in meeting the intended outcomes of these courses. 
Melvin, that is so important. I've um, realized the power of this idea of like program evaluation and we for transitional math have started tracking some of our students because we've been doing that long enough now where we can look at that outcome at the post-secondary level and see how, you know, not based on student name, obviously, but just kind of from an aggregate perspective, how many of those students who completed transitional math with a C or better then placed into credit bearing coursework and then were successful in that course. And for us as a local partnership, that's very illuminating and it allows us to go back and check and adjust. And so um, not only as a state, but as a, as a local partnership, I would encourage you as you're engaging in these conversations, what is that success criteria? How will you measure whether or not what you're doing is effective and how are we sharing that? Um, not only with our local partners, but how are we sharing that statewide? Because there, there's a lot of profound impact with the work that we're doing. And if we're seeing success, we need to be able to share and communicate that. So thank you. Well, we will leave slide 30 open and the chat open as well. If you have other ideas, we would love to hear them because uh, we are interested in doing work that meets your needs for sure. So I'm going to stop talking now because I've been talking for a very long time and I'm going to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Melvin Harrison, to share the work of the Community College Board. Uh, thank you, Angie. And if you wouldn't mind just uh, just continue to advance the slides. I won't be long. What people don't know is that uh, this is really Angie's presentation, and I just latched on to the end of it to just tell you what the community colleges are doing, uh, what the community college board is doing. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, ICCB has committed uh, more than $3 million to the support and the scaling of transitional instruction across. Uh, the state, uh, particularly uh, since the inception of this work. Um, and we've done so in many ways, uh, uh, supporting professional development, uh, providing support to the uh, state agency, uh, interagency work group that is continuing to uh, develop and, and make all of this happen. Uh, and of course, uh, engaging with our consultants uh, in ed systems and other uh, stakeholders who are a part of this work. And so uh, we've uh, made a uh, what I consider a substantial commitment to this work and to the expansion. But we also are very uh, pleased to have been able to uh, support the system uh, in this work by providing uh, support and pilot grants um, for the last three uh, fiscal years, uh, we've been able to provide direct support to institutions uh, in developing and scaling uh, transitional math. Uh, in fiscal year 20, um, our grants focused on scaling transitional math courses uh, across the state. A lot of time had been spent piloting it. We had been implementing it throughout. And so uh, the in, in fiscal year 20, the agency determined that it was time to kick that into gear. And so uh, we've been able to uh, provide support to uh, all of our community college institutions uh, to work with their uh, school district partners in, in K-12 to really implement and expand and scale uh, transitional math. Uh, also, we were able to support in fiscal year 20 uh, English pilots. Um, which helped to inform our competency development process. Um, so a lot of the work that we that Angie talked about, uh, particularly in getting these competencies off the ground and some of the work that's been done uh, to support transitional English uh, and language arts uh, instruction and, and courses, uh, a lot of that was informed by many of our early pilots uh, and many of which were uh, funded and supported uh, through these grants. Um, in fiscal year 20, because it was the year of COVID, uh, or 21 rather, the year of COVID, we uh, were able to support institutions on, uh, on transitional, or we provided grants that focus on uh, instruction uh, innovation. Uh, we were in, everybody was largely in a virtual or hybrid world and uh, learning was taking place in a very different way. Uh, and so our grants uh, targeted and focused uh, instructional innovations and supported institutions in 
pivoting to online and hybrid uh, learning, um, uh, focused on um, understanding instruction in the pandemic uh, and understanding the learning needs of the students who were enrolled in these transitional instruction courses. And of course, continue to support the expansion of transitional English. Um, and so uh, that work um, wrapped up at the end of this uh, this past fiscal year. And so we're continuing to sift through that. And hopefully that information will help inform our professional development moving forward and so many other things. And so this year uh, we were able to support through our uh, fiscal year 22 grants. Uh, they will focus on the expansion of uh, transitional English across the state and scaling it statewide. And so we'll continue to make uh, investments and support available to institutions to do those things. Uh, and um, now that the competencies are released uh, and we're collecting some data and students are uh, progressing through these courses and then ultimately through um, our community colleges, we will begin the program evaluation process. And that's a, a very uh, valuable um, uh, part of our uh, of our experiences to understand uh, what's working and what's not, how well things are working. Um, and it's also important uh, because our university partners um, are continuing to use our evaluation data and the assessments that we're using to make decisions on whether or not they will, uh, whether they will accept uh, transitional instruction uh, courses for placement. Uh, at their institution. So we're excited to begin that work. Next slide, please. Ah, so uh, our funds, the funds were used in a variety of ways uh, in those grants uh, to develop uh, curricular resources and to align uh, curriculum uh, to uh, the competencies and the policies of uh, transitional English and transitional math. Uh, as Angie stated, um, uh, transitional English was a little bit of a, a, a different, uh, required a little bit, of, uh, a little bit of different strategy, if you will, largely because, uh, as, as she used the term that I wrote down, it can be dovetailed to uh, some uh, ex an existing course, and so um, we uh, supported. Uh, partnerships to align those courses with the competencies and make adjustments to develop appropriate courses for them and to pilot them. Uh, professional learning and training will continue to use, uh, many of our institutions use their grants to support uh, to support uh, professional learning. And I anticipate that we'll continue to do that. And that is a, a, a valuable asset and element that we expect uh, for our grants moving forward. Um, evaluation, not only of curricular resources, but instructional strategies. Um, and uh, all of that is to help inform our resource development and the other things uh, that continue to be ongoing. Uh, it supported course pilots, uh, many course pilots, particularly in transitional English. Uh, it's supporting the development of a virtual course uh, in transitional instruction for math, uh, and I anticipate subsequently uh, in English as well. And so um, that continues to be something that um, that our grants and uh, grant funds will support. And uh, of course, uh, the effectiveness of transitional instruction program of, as a whole, uh, engaging in assessment and evaluation. So there are a number of tools that we uh, will use and do use uh, to continue to evaluate the assessment of uh, transition instruction. Next slide, please. As a result of all the hard work uh, that has gone into this, um, as of March 1st, uh, 59 active uh, approved pathways for statewide portability uh, have um, uh, are, uh, are approved uh, since the launch of our grants uh, in FY20. So uh, it really uh, helped us to get to a place to where we're continuing to see um, uh, fast and uh, quality scaling of our transitional uh, math and English programs. There are 349 high schools approved to offer 
uh, transitional math courses to date right now um, across our state. And 19 of those high schools are approved to offer transitional uh, English courses uh, following the launch of the successful launch of our transitional English portability process, which um, accepted and evaluated its first sets of courses uh, during the fall of 2021. So excited about a lot of work. Um, hopefully the next time I'm able to present on this work, we'll talk about the number of students that have been served and how, uh, how that's happening. And as we continue to collect our data, uh, that's definitely something I look forward to reporting. Next slide, please. So what's next? Angie talked about a lot of the work that we have to do. And so uh, from ICCB's perspective, uh, it's all valuable. And so uh, we'll continue to focus on the evaluation, program evaluation of transitional math courses. Uh, we want to continue and focus on developing the virtual course for transitional math. Uh, we want to, uh, and subsequently transitional English, uh, we want to not begin the process. I should have updated that. We want to continue uh, statewide portability approval process for transitional English, which started last fall. And so uh, as of yesterday, uh, there are some new uh, institutions who are submitting courses um, that the panel will review later this month. Um, thank you. Thank you. Because I'm going to forget to do that later. Um, and uh, we want to offer more professional learning opportunities. Uh, we understand how valuable that is uh, to the field, uh, that we understand how valuable that is to uh, not only our community college faculty, but also to our K-12 partners as well. And so we'll continue to try to make funds available to support that. And uh, we support and continue to uh, solicit feedback and provide information on what types of professional learning opportunities are available. And I don't know what developing, in, that was an incomplete thought number five. <laughs> Oh, no, uh, we want to continue. We will develop a transition instruction website, but also uh, there is a uh, uh, we're also in the process of continuing to develop a database. Um, uh, it's a database for advisors and community colleges to be able to uh, identify students uh, who come through their admissions process. Um, who have completed transitional instruction. So uh, doing some data sharing and to develop some sort of uh, resource to be able to identify students who have completed uh, transitional courses. Because, you know, sometimes students get in courses and they don't really know what they've taken. They don't know what the difference between a transitional instruction course and a regular course. I just know I took a course, I got a class and it passed. Whether it's transitional or not, we don't know. So uh, in order to be able to support advisors who are advising students uh, and helping them navigate the matriculation process, uh, that database uh, is uh, being created. So next slide. Yes. So uh, I want you to ask yourself, particularly for those who are at institutions, um, is our transitional uh, instruction courses available at your institution and do you have partnerships? Are you, how, uh, and if you don't, um, at, reach out to me so that we can have conversations about how to make that work. I'll connect you with the appropriate community college or K-12 partner um, that's working on it. Um, and no, I'm not gonna send you to the vice president who probably may or may not know who's in, who does instruct, who does transition instruction on that campus, but I'll try to, I'll definitely link you to the people who are uh, on the ground doing the work and working with our institutions. Um, we have 39 community college districts uh, who are uh, who are approved uh, to do that this, um, this term after this uh, session of the portability review, we anticipate that all 39 community college districts will uh, be approved to uh, offer at least one transitional math pathway. 
Um, so uh, we're continuing to do that work and we want to expand it. We want to expand that. We want to grow the number of high schools who are offering uh, transitional instruction across the state. And so we're happy to support that um, any way that we can through uh, ICCD. And you're welcome to reach out uh, to me for that. Next slide, please. So that's all I have. Uh, any questions, comments, or angry exhortations? I take them all. Uh, don't worry, I won't be offended by any of it as well. And I'm sure uh, if you have questions for Angie, uh, now's a good time to ask them because we have a couple of minutes to entertain them. So uh, feel free to uh, hop. So I see uh, Liz has her hand raised. Uh, I'm going to call on Liz, uh, but before I do, I I just saw as Melvin was sharing, uh, my my dear friend and partner from our local partnership is on with us today, Janice Jones from Sauk Valley Community College. Um, our regional partnership would not be um, where it is without her leadership. So I wanted to shout out to her and uh, Gail Wright is our, our one of our data specialists working on some of our connections with pathways. So, you know, this work is all intertwined and it is so vitally important. Um, also, Heather and Melvin are incredible people and leaders in this work. And I have never been part of an initiative where we've got such great representation from state agencies. And so I really appreciate their leadership and commitment to this as well. So wanted to make sure I got those shout outs in there. Melvin, you didn't include shout outs on your slides. So I'm giving the shout outs. <laughs> but Liz has her hand raised. Liz, yes, we'd love to hear from you. Hi, I was just, um, you all mentioned that there are some four-year schools that are accepting the portability of this course. I was wondering which ones those are so we can share them with our high school partners. I will defer that question to Melvin. Oh, you would ask that as I'm going to rush to get to the IBHE website where that is. Uh, looks like uh, Heather is going to uh, get to me. IBHE uh, has published on their website which institutions are accepting uh, transitional instruction courses. Um, and I think, yes, she put that on in the chat. That link is in the chat. Uh, we're continuing to work with four-year partners uh, through the Board of Higher Education uh, to make uh, that happen. Currently, they're only uh, accepting transitional math courses um, as we continue to develop English and scale it uh, statewide. Uh, I anticipate that there are some others, but um, I know that Northern uh, is was was among was among the first of our partners to really uh, get into uh, the acceptance of transition additional instruction, uh, Northwest, Northeastern and, um, and Eastern are two other uh, institutions that, that accept them. Uh, they may not accept all of them, but they accept at least one of the pathways. Um, and so we're continuing to work to expand that. And so uh, uh, we'll up, that information is always updated and maintained fresh on the IBHE website. Great question, Liz. Other uh, questions, comments, concerns, and I won't add in there the angry part. I will add cookies. I need cookies. <laughs> Please feel free to unmute or go ahead and put it in the chat. We'd be happy to hear from you or maybe hear from what your partnership is doing or to answer any questions. Since she's on the call, Janice Jones, anything that I left out about our local uh, partnership work that you would like to add from the college's perspective? She probably won't talk to me after this. <laughs> you, have, you have a habit of doing that. <laughs> Melvin and I have worked together long enough now that he's, he's got me to a T. <laughs> uh, one of our community college uh, advocates and uh, person who's working, Bob Cofield, is on. And he has he mentioned in the comment that they're planning professional development opportunities with Angie for a couple of weeks from today. What? All right. I'm excited. <laughs> Yeah, we, uh, we've been working really hard, like a lot of community colleges and school districts across the state, um, 
but where we have uh, run into a little bit of a challenge is just developing the opportunity to bring our all of our high schools together that now are fairly far into the process and where they really wanted to get a lot more support was in um, in that curriculum development piece, which is certainly not my forte. Um, so I wanted to bring in one of the experts and thankfully Angie was willing to, uh, to, to schedule something. So yeah, a couple of weeks from today, uh, we have uh, several from our local high schools and I don't know, um, we currently have seven high schools in our area that are offering transitional English courses. Um, five of them that just uh, submitted documentation. Well, we submitted documentation for one for statewide portability, but five in our local advisory um, panel area that uh, are hoping to gain portability. So yeah, the, 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 the biggest push on our end now is trying to take a deeper dive into their curriculum and give them an opportunity to collaborate because they've been working um, in, in a siloed approach for the last couple of months or so. So now it's a good opportunity to bring them all together to talk about what's working, what's not, you know, challenges that they're facing and things like that. So again, thanks to uh, Angie for being willing to do that. And also to you, Melvin, for uh, coordinating the whole effort on the part of the ICCB. I'm sure it's a massive undertaking. You don't know the half of it. But if you all are serving lunch, I'm going to come and crash this development for sure. <laughs> Uh, maybe, maybe next time we, you know, we're in the community, you know, in the community college setting, we're still kind of on that bubble of, mm -hmm. you know, pandemic, not pandemic. What are we doing? What are we not doing? And so um, I, I think we were, we were planning out just a little bit too far to be able to include a meal this time around, but next time for sure. All right. Okay. I'll, I'll save my, my gas because it's high right now, but I'm coming next time for sure. Melvin, we would welcome you. That would be a treat. Um, and Bob, I'm really looking forward to conversations and work with, with your partnership. So I, you know, I, I would add that, you know, as we think about, you know, we talked about the pandemic as we're, we're moving hopefully out into a different phase. It's not normal. It's whatever new normal is. I see Heather has her fingers crossed, but as we hopefully start to transition into a different phase, um, recognizing the fact that some things have changed, I think going back to this idea of partnerships and going back to this idea of what do we value and how is how have our kids changed and how has education changed? Um, this, the conversations around transitional coursework are a per perfect platform to just re-engage, reset, and reinvest um, in our students and our communities. So I, I applaud all of you, each and every one of you, for being on this call today and for the, the continued work that you do with your community colleges, your districts, um, and your partnerships, because um, that, I, that work will pay off. So, so, so appreciative of all of you. Well, Heather, we are at 1129. Um, I don't know if, uh, if you would like to take us home. Sure. <laughs> I want to give a big, is it a cookie, a shout out? I'm not sure now. I have no angry exhortations, uh, but just a, a big shout out to Angie and Melvin for sharing today and all the work that they're doing. And um, I really think this point about it, and Angie had mentioned this before, like, especially engaging with like English teachers and teachers in a new thing, like with change, sometimes there's a fear of loss, right? So how you actually start those conversations and, and talk about what it is that teachers might be worried about, right? To show how within the competencies, within the course parameters, like those things are addressed, maybe in a different way, right? But you're still engaging in a lot of that work. Um, I know for me as a former high school science teacher, it was a very new space working with an English crew, um, but it's been really wonderful. And, you know, like Angie shared earlier, Melvin too, right? All the different volunteers, like the English folks who are doing this just for, for no payment, right? They're just here to provide resources, provide insights. Um, they really continue to enjoy learning from each other too, as they provide resources for you. So um, just a big thank you to, to Angie and Melvin for all that you do and for everyone here on the line as you continue to grapple with transitional English and what that looks like and um, just thank you for all of your work because it's a means a lot to students. I mean, English is very much a, a, a gatekeeper course um, for a lot of courses beyond just an English pathway, right, um, as students transition to post-secondary. So thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>